Hello everyone, welcome to our webinar today. The topic for today's webinar is Mobile Solar Plus Storage for Emergency Management. This webinar is being presented by Clean Energy Group's Resilient Power Project, and we have a really exciting lineup of speakers today. Before I pass it over to them, I'd like to go over a few very quick webinar logistics. All of our attendees today are in listen-only mode. You can access the audio portion of the webinar by calling in via telephone or connecting via your computer's mic and speakers. If you'd like to minimize the webinar console, you can do that by clicking on the orange arrow that you see circled here on your screen. And you can also click on that orange arrow to expand your webinar console. And one of the things that you might like to do with your webinar console is to submit your questions and comments. We will be uh, having a Q&A following our presentations and it makes for a really exciting webinar when we can answer a lot of questions. So do type yours in when you think of them um, and we'll get to as many as we can. And a final note, this webinar is being recorded. We will send you a link to the webinar recording as well as a PDF of the webinar slides. We'll probably get that out later today. And they'll also be posted on our website at cleanegroup.org slash webinars. And that's a good URL to know because it is where we post all of our webinar archives as well as info about upcoming webinars, which we always have lots of. So with that, um, I'll now pass it over to my colleague, Mari Almango. Mari is a project director here at Clean Energy Group, and she is going to get us started. Hi, everyone. My name is Mari Almango. I'm a project director at Clean Energy Group. And uh, thank you so much for joining us today. We have a very exciting webinar and topic to discuss. Before I introduce the presenters, I just wanted to give a little quick introduction as to who we are, Clean Energy Group. CEG is a primarily foundation-funded nonprofit organization. Our work involves providing technical assistance and policy support, as well as information sharing on clean energy topics. Our partner organizations include state and federal energy agencies, industry leaders, utilities, developers, NGOs, grassroots organizations, and national labs. We also have a sister organization, Clean Energy States Alliance which is a membership coalition of organizations, primarily state agencies that manage clean energy funds. This webinar today is brought to you by the Resilient Power Project. The Resilient Power Project was created in response to Superstorm Sandy and the resulting outages in the Northeast, the impacts of which disproportionately impacted communities of color and low-income communities. Since then, we've expanded our work and are currently active in resilient power advocacy and project development across the country. The Resilient Power Project aims to improve access to resilient power technologies, primarily solar PV and battery storage, in low-income communities and communities of color. Resilient Power Project partners include community organizations, nonprofits, indigenous-led organizations, affordable housing developers, and local governments. Our focus areas are policy development, one-on-one -on -one technical assistance, project development, and awareness building, including publishing reports like those pictured here. You can find our resources and more information about our projects Pardon me, our pro programs at our website. Through 101 technical assistance and solar and storage feasibility assessment support, the Resilient Power Project has supported over 250 projects across the country. You'll hear about some of them today, most of which are in historically underserved communities. Many projects highlighted on this map are located in the East and West Coast, but you'll see that we're increasingly working throughout the United States, especially in the Gulf Coast and the Southeast. If you're interested in learning more about the Technical Assistance Fund and how it can support your specific project in developing solar and storage resources, please check out our website. Now on to the great list of presenters we have today. I'm gonna to go ahead and um, give the bios for all the presenters now, and then we can go through, and uh, that way we can keep moving when folks um, are ready for their presentation. So first up today, we have uh, Will, Hey, guard, apologies, Will, if I'm saying your last name incorrectly, um, and Jamie. Will and Jamie both work at the Footprint Project, who will be uh, beginning the presentation today. The Footprint Project's mission is to help build back greener after climate disasters by mobilizing cleaner energy for communities in crisis. They are a 501c3 nonprofit disaster service organization that develops and deploys solar generator networks to empower community resilience. Footprint Project works across the disaster management cycle to expand frontline access to cleaner technologies and reduce dependence on fossil fuels. 
Since 2018, the Footprint Project has mobilized solar generators to over 15 disaster response and recovery missions, providing emergency power access to over 25,000 U.S. citizens. Will is the Operations Director at the Footprint Project. He previously worked with International Medical Corps to deploy sol solar refrigeration in West Africa during the Ebola outbreak. He then deployed with Team Rubicon after disasters in Louisiana, Minnesota, and Puerto Rico. Jamie is a program manager of Footprint Project. Prior to the, her work there, she has over a decade of experience in state and federal government, as well as the nonprofit sector. She previously worked on the Environment and Natural Resources Committee at the Minnesota House of Representatives and on the U.S.-Mexico border with the Department of Homeland Security's Citizenship and Immigration Services. Up next, we have Chuck Sarazoli. Chuck has been fire chief for two years and deputy fire chief for five years. He has been in the fire service since 2000, including service as paramedic, fire lieutenant, and fire captain. He is currently the fire chief of a small rural fire department in Northwest Colorado, Steamboat Springs Fire Rescue, that happens to also be the home of the Steamboat Ski Resort as well. They have a full-time population of around 19,000 residents, and that increases by 15,000 during a busy ski, ski weekend. Finally, we have Craig Moreau. Craig is the emergency management co coordinator for FIA County and serves on the Capital Area Homeland Security Task Force and the Austin Regional Intelligence Center. Craig gained his experience in emergency management as a firefighter, paramedic, and senior captain with the Houston Fire Department, as well as disaster response, medical mission trips, and safe water ministries around the world. Craig joined the FIA County response community as the chief emergency management and homeland security in 2019. Shortly thereafter, the COVID crisis gripped the world, and he and his team initiated the first drive through COVID testing site in rural Texas, securing millions of dollars of PPE for their local healthcare providers, and they're active in the vaccination efforts for their county. He and his team were also heavily involved with the winter storm URI response and recovery and several recent hazmat incidents. With that impressive list of our presenters, I will pass it over to Will to uh, begin us, start us off. Cool, thanks Mari. I realize I gotta take myself on mute here. Um, and I'm hopeful Jamie will be uh, walking in the door shortly. She was just stuck in traffic. Otherwise you're stuck with me. Um, so I'm gonna give a brief background on Footprint Project and then kind of talk through the, tee up our, our awesome next speakers who we have worked with really closely um, in both Colorado and Texas. So Footprint Project's mi mission is to help communities build back greener after disasters by mobilizing cleaner energy to communities in crisis. We really work across the disaster management cycle, cycle and a lot of our work comes down to finding, begging, borrowing, um, repurposing, upcycling solar battery equipment, and then putting it in the hands of frontline first and second responders to uh, offset or displace um, single source gas or diesel generators, kind of in that two to 10 kilowatt um, generator range. Um, and I, our, our kind of history really came out of um, a, the reality that disasters are growing more frequent and cost than ever. Uh, this is probably not news to many people, um, but the, the, the way that we respond to disasters hasn't really changed a lot in the last few decades, particularly how we power disaster response and recovery is really based on single source gas or diesel generators um, that actually have become a growing cause of not only emergencies within the, the more larger disaster, but also have knock-on negative effects ranging from localized air pollution to um, dependence on uh, a single source of fuel. Uh, and I think our, our co-presenters can talk more about kind of the challenges and the benefits of, of having a diverse range of, of energy sources when the the grid um, is is impacted. Our uh, our focus at Footprint Project is really to kind of break that negative feedback loop of responding to um, environmental emergencies with uh, fossil fuel generators. 
Um, so pretty simple problem. We, we got started kind of in the aftermath of Hurricane Maria and other domestic disasters where we started cobbling together, um, donated a repurposed battery and solar components, putting them on wheels and then deploying them to um, power up um, partner aid agencies or first and second responders for aid distribution sites or um, you know, small scale refrigeration, communications equipment, et cetera. Um, the reality is that the, you know, a, lots of, you know, everyone wants to help and there's a lot of aid um, that gets sent in, but there's not a lot of technical support on mobilizing um, cleaner technologies in uh, the event of these larger uh, grid emergencies. And so we kind of fill that gap by providing equipment, resources, training, et cetera. Um, so our programs really break down into kind of three buckets the disaster response bucket which is by far our kind of you know our core bread and butter mobilizing uh renewable or cleaner technologies um, to provide uh electricity and energy access for responders and survivors um, in between disasters we help assemble new solar generators in a region and then train local partners to plug in that um, can be anyone from a you know a small mutual aid group to a um, fire station or, or other more kind of traditional or larger um, emergency uh, management agencies and then we use the solar um, waste recovery or upcycled components to assemble these new fleets. And that's a lot of how we keep the cost down on the, the equipment itself. So we're, we uh, accept uh, you know, Second Life solar um, panels, uh, repurposed or manufacturer test batteries, um, donated or, or upcycled inverters, test them, integrate them into new community resilience um, builds or to create new fleets that then can be activated during a, a grid outage emergency. Um, we already kind of touched on the impact, so I'm not gonna spend too much time here, but um, in the past, you know, our kind of 2021 was really uh, where we started to see um, uh, real growth and what the you know the availability of equipment and our ability to rapidly deploy it. Um, Hurricane Ida alone was was our largest response to date, but we've also uh, deployed um, microgrids and solar generators to the Kentucky tornadoes after the Puerto Rico earthquakes, the Tennessee tornado in 2020, both uh, Nashville and Chattanooga. Um, we we sent a solar tent and a solar trailer to a COVID-19 field clinic on the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, during COVID, and uh, we've also sent equipment, you know, into the California wildfires, uh, mostly in Northern California, but we have a network of mobile solar generators kind of scattered across the, the Pacific Coast and the Gulf Coast that we activate for these, these events. And then uh, what we, the way we kind of think of our work is we're either, um, you know, in a non-emergency where we're providing energy consults, doing outreach, training uh, first and second responders how to plug into this equipment, um, providing, building new equipment with partners, um, doing in-person trainings, workshops, et cetera. As, and then once the, the disasters hit, uh, we take in site uh, requests, we provide energy assessment, assessments to tr basically triage the energy loads for emergency uh, um, partners or responding agencies. We provide in-person support and remote support, and then we deploy everything we have in a region, set it up, plug people in, make sure they don't plug stuff in that's too uh, heavy duty, and then try to keep them um, running off of cleaner energy sources for as long as possible. Um, through 2030, our, our goal is to really decarbonize disaster relief and, and that um, industry as a whole by developing national networks of, of new kind of more sustainable, deployable energy infrastructure, training a workforce of volunteer and professional responders, and piloting new bottles of community resilience um, that can activate this equipment so when it so it's not sitting in a lot somewhere when it's um, off uh, a disaster. So I'm just gonna talk quickly about three sites that we kind of see commonly during these disasters, and I'm sure Chuck and Craig have um, have stories as well. This is a, a portable solar generator that we set up just in March after um, the New Orleans tornado that struck Araby um, and then Lower Ninth Ward. This powered a, a pop-up aid station with a Wi-Fi, you know, 
access point and a fridge um, at a local restaurant that was sort of basically providing a space for for um, the affected you know neighbors to come and and check in get some food get some ice and and um, check you know get online and and um, communicate uh, this site is kind of a, a larger system that we use, a towable system. So it's a trailer frame with uh, batteries inside and a solar array on the roof. With this, in this case, that picture you're seeing here was a, a during the Tennessee tornadoes in March of 2020, outside of a church in North Nashville, where this system was used to power, you know, this kind of the same stuff, Wi-Fi. Um, and emergency, you know, cell phone charging, the basics, but also we noticed folks, uh, a gentleman would use it, use the trailer to charge his electric wheelchair. We had um, people starting, you know, plugging in the fridges of the church to keep the food cold overnight. And then uh, um, LED string lights to provide some some scene lighting um, at night when when kind of the the daytime distribution site was was taken down and people went home this largest site we've done so far is a you know a full-scale volunteer base camp with you know supporting up to 20 um, volunteers at a time this was using a palletized solar micro mobile solar microgrid so it had um, a battery system on a pallet as well as a uh, ground mount solar array that we set up uh, with volunteers outside of Houma, Louisiana after Hurricane Ida. Um, the, I think the interesting part of, of this work and where it where it's, um, gets exciting is how this these different size pieces of equipment can be paired and kind of match, you know, mixed and matched to do ver to provide various tra tactical energy advantages in a um, field operation. So that um, site there, which was at, at a uh, Puerto Rico fire station, consisted of a trailer as well as two tents, but those trailers and tents can include lots of portable systems that can all charge off the quote unquote mothership and then be deployed for portable um, energy access in hospitals or stationed outside of, of um, camps or other aid sites to provide kind of the, the larger plugs. So really breaking up those energy loads and, and providing um, electricity access in different ways than we normally really think about when um, just using a single source fossil fuel generator. Um, that really comes down to, you know, a new kind of way of looking at does it power and disaster energy access where you know traditionally when you only have access to a hammer everything looks like a nail that's very much kind of how we we think of the fossil fuel generator in uh, power outage emergencies if you only know how to keep your generator filled and hopefully to keep it out of the garage so you're not um, at risk of uh, um, carbon monoxide poisoning, uh, you know, there's only one way to get power. But now, we, with these new technologies coming down the pipe, we can really explore different ways of of breaking up the energy loads, providing lots of batteries and solar panels in different configurations to um, deliver energy access to those who need it most. And that's, I think, where a lot of these conversations on decentralization of the, the energy grid, microgrids, et cetera, they, that can be talked, you know, you can talk about that as a how to power a hospital. You can also talk about it as how to power, you know, one um, uh, person, in a single home that just needs access to a small battery for their CPAP and their electric wheelchair for that three-day um, power outage. Um, so yeah, we spend a lot of time training, uh, deploying, and focusing on really on you know showing people or, or talking through people's what their you know load management, making sure they're not plugging heaters into a portable. Um, uh, solar generator that will only run that heater for a half an hour. Um, and then we did just start to launch our smart solar smart hands training for our, our volunteers and other um, uh, first and second responders. So if any of you are on that call, please, on this call, please sh check it out. It's basically the kind of rough, very basic rules on how to deploy a solar generator. 
um, which we're hoping to expand. I think the, these conversations really boil down to can, you know, once the equipment is available, how to get people trained up to use it effectively, then how to move it around effectively. So we're doing a lot of logistics, storing, staging, transporting, um, maintaining them in the field and working on building a remote monitoring platform to keep track of where this equipment goes and whether it's on or off. Um, and then reporting of the impacts of this equipment in disaster um, response and, and resilience scenarios. We have a lot of work still to do in, in measuring kind of not just what the, you know, how many kilowatts did this unit produce for this um, single event and how many people plugged in, but also the kind of qualitative impacts of using uh, this type of equipment where there's no noise, there's no fumes, um, and, and that kind of other doors that open up when people are able to take that logistics person that was otherwise responsible on main, to maintain the generator and fill it up, um, you know that those qualitative um, impacts we we are still learning as we do this. We're also trying to get ahead of acknowledging, you know, we we tow these solar trailers and move this solar generator equipment around using um, fossil fuel, you know, gas and diesel vehicles. We're hoping to, you know, if anyone has a contact to Rivian or Ford, please reach out. We'd uh, love to explore that type of stuff. We're in line, um, but there's, our, we're trying to be really honest about what we're, you know, if we're deploying a, a cleaner energy system to a disaster, what, what are those, both those positive impacts, but also the, the um, negative impacts of, of utilizing um, fossil fuels, as well as, you know, these things can't power everything that a, uh, you know, two kilowatt solar trailer and a two kilowatt um, gas generator are not necessarily one and the same. Um, it's really, they, they're kind of different tools in a toolkit and we need to be honest about what they can and can't do. Um, we're, we're focusing on building that stuff into grant writing and then we do have learned that there's lots of sponsorship opportunities for assembling new units. The one on the left is, it was sponsored by Duke Energy and it's our first uh, piece of equipment available in North Carolina. Um, so we're, we're trying to report on, on our um, programs a little more holistically in the future. Um, yeah, that's all I got. I'm gonna turn it over to Chuck and I just wanna shout out before we start, thank you both to Chuck and Craig for spending your time with us today. Um, this, I know you guys have a lot of <laughs> real <laughs> emergencies and other things going on and we're, we're greatly uh, appreciative of taking your time to share your story with this, this equipment. Chuck, I think you're muted. Thanks, Will. You'd think you'd figure that out at this point, right? Two and a half years in. I did the same thing. <laughs> um, I, I, it looks like I'm next, so I'll, I'll jump in. Um, uh, again, uh, at, my bio was mentioned at the beginning uh, of the webinar, but my name is Chuck Sarasoli. I'm the fire chief in Steamboat Springs, Colorado. Um, we're located in Northwest Colorado, um, a rural part of the state. Um, however, we do have a ski resort, so we um, have quite a large tourist population that comes in and out, um, both in the summer and the winter time, as well as about 20,000 um, residents in our in our fire district alone, uh, and closer to 30,000 in our county. Um, so we can go ahead and um, I don't think I have control of the slide, so um, we could skip to the next slide. Um, so we were introduced to this project, um, really, I'd say kind of by, um, uh, well, uh, we were reached out um, for, uh, from a gentleman who I'm blanking his name, unfortunately, I didn't prepare myself with that, but um, he came by and, and was uh, basically offering to, to help train our firefighters on how to respond to solar, um, homes with solar, uh, solar arrays on them and battery uh, storage. And so, um, that came with this Footprint Project's um, solar trailer, um, and we really started kind of doing a crash course on, on how we could utilize that trailer. Um, it was a new concept for us, and so we jumped in and tried to try to figure out how we could use it when they said we, we would have it for the summer. Um, the training, first of all, to start off with was an excellent training for our firefighters. Um, it's a 
it's a field that um, you know continues to 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 grow, and we see a lot more homes with solar arrays and solar panels on them. So that awareness for our firefighters was invaluable. Um, and then with the the solar trailer, we started immediately thinking, um, how can we utilize this? And this was. Um, was the folks that came up, dropped the trailer off, and they did a quick training with our group. And in, in this picture, um, we have our county emergency manager, as well as um, a fire chief from a neighboring district. And we, we share the trailer and utilize it with, with those agencies as well. Um, although primarily it's been Steamboat Fire that has been using the trailer. Um, we can go ahead and skip to the next slide. Um, one of the things we um, utilized this initially for was we had uh, a local fire that um, started in federal lands, um, spread to some private property in, in our neighboring fire district. And whenever that happens, um, wildfires in our area, we involve um, pretty much all the fire districts in our county. Uh, eventually that fire, so that fire starts off um, as most fires do, kind of fairly small, but growing rapidly. And our response to those um, has to go through numerous steps before it really reaches a large scale um, incident command system through the, through the state or through the feds agency. And, and that's what this, this fire did. And so we immediately start, jumped in with a type four team, which is a very regional local county team, um, incident command team that, that initially jumped in to manage the fire. Um, we start with our local um, command and communications and command um, vehicle, which you see here, which is operated through the county. Um, and we situated that in an area and started setting up a command post in an area of an old ski resort that really doesn't have um, any electrical support or anything along those lines. And so we deployed the trailer out there to um, initially plug into this comm van um, to prevent them from having to run their trailer all the um, or their uh, generator constantly while they're out there um, and provide support to um, some of the additional accessories that were out there. Eventually this fire grew. Um, it went to a type three team, which is um, a more expanded regional team um, that includes some state representatives as well. Um, the Fed, the National Forest Service was incident command on it, but they were utilizing all of our local resources. And then, um, and then this fire went to a type two team um, where we had a national um, type two incident command team come in. And of course, with that, they really um, set up the command post um, for support of the crews, for support of all the different aspects of a command team. And so we additionally utilized this trailer to plug in the logistics section. Um, you know, they set up a, a yurt. They had basically set up offices with printers, computers, um, and all their needs for their logistics section. And we um, also supplied them um, power to that to the to their yurt. They, um, you know, when we would come by and visit them as they were running this fire and providing that support, we'd pop in, and they were were blown away with the capabilities that this trailer could provide them in and most impressively they were excited about the fact that it was quiet um, they weren't breathing in exhaust fumes from the the generators and they didn't have that constant drone of a generator um, in the back background for them while they were trying to do their work all day long um, we also set this trailer up um, when it was delivered with us to us um, the cool thing about this trailer is that the actual insides of it is is really empty. There's a, a couple of batteries, so there's a little bit of battery storage on either side right over the wheels and the control center um, inverter, but otherwise it was it, it's pretty empty. And so we were able to um, put a, um, a, right now, a dorm size fridge in there, um, refrigerator plus chairs plus tables and a fan, a bigger box fan. And so it created a location where folks could come and grab some cold water, um, sit down in front of a fan and be in the shade for a while um, without, um, you know, without leaving the scene and, with, and, and cooling down during the, the hot months of the, of the fire. And so um, this trailer was a big hit at this command center and we expect to use it a bunch again this, uh, this winter. Um, the nice thing about it 
is the way it's set up currently. Um, I can tow it with a small Ford Interceptor, small SUV um, easily tows this because it's really not that heavy um, overall as well. Um, we can skip to the next slide. I think I have a couple more pictures of, um, well, well, we'll get to more pictures of that deployment. This deployment um, of the trailer, uh, along with my dog, you can see uh, Luke, it was deployed. We had a um, we had an incident at one of our um, underserved communities, a trailer park um, just on the, the edge of town, that they had a, um, a surge, a, a, an electrical surge that um, went through basically outdated um, power lines and control mechanisms and started numerous fires at um, two or three of the trailers located in the trailer park. Um, once we worked our way through that problem, we realized that the infrastructure at this trailer park was very outdated um, and any sort of electrical surge was going directly into the trailers. Um, our building department and, um, and fire marshal here um, came to the decision that we needed to shut down the power to about 15 to 20 trailers um, until we were able to get contractors in there to look at um, the issue, evaluate the infrastructure, which is all underground and under these trailers. And so we were looking at two months um, at least that we felt these trailers would be without power. Um, this community uh, was not easily adaptable. Off, most of them did not have insurance of any sort for their trailers um, or for, their, their, for them to go and stay in a a hotel or somewhere else. A lot of them did not have friends or family that they could stay with. And so um, most of them decided that they wanted to hunker down and just stay in their trailers and wait it out. Um, again, this is in July uh, of, of last year. Um, so hot, hot months for, for our area. Um, so what we did was we didn't, we didn't really have the ability to feed every trailer with electricity. Um, but there, we, we narrowed it down to their biggest need was food storage, um, ice storage, um, so or, or supplying them ice so that they could keep their coolers in their homes um, stocked with ice so that they could keep some of their food cool at home. Um, and then uh, also a place for them to come and charge, uh, like we said, computers, um, anything that they might need to charge up during this time. Um, without having to wander too far from home. And so what you don't see here is on the inside of the trailer, we actually have um, another two full-size refrigerators and we set up shelves that they could do some food storage inside the trailer as well. And so we stocked that chest freezer with ice. Um, we allowed, we put food storage out here and then we had that box fan and, and dorm fridge, like I said, inside here. So this is it somewhat deployed. Um, underneath the awning, we were also able to set up tables and chairs so that folks from the, from the, the community could come sit down on their computers. Um, as Will mentioned, there's Wi-Fi capability off of this trailer, and so they were able to support them. Um, eventually, we did get the power up. It did take about two and a half months total, and so uh, this trailer stayed there for that time frame um, to support them. You can skip to the next slide. Uh, this is another picture of that muddy slide fire and that command post. Um, this is when it's up to the type three um, incident command team. As you can see, they have um, a lot more going on here, uh, including, um, you know, the comm van, um, communications and everything else. And so the trailer ended up being a valuable part of that command post. Um, you can go ahead and skip to the next slide. Um, this is just another picture of us uh, at the deployment of, of the trailer park um, with a different angle. You can see our county emergency manager is involved in this as well, and we all um, kind of work together to get this dialed in. We actually set, were able to set up days where our local United Way came by. A lot of these residents were having difficulty communicating. The landlord of the trailer park was fairly absent. Uh, and felt that this was not his responsibility, that the, it was more the, the individual trailer home owner's responsibility. They didn't know what to do. And so we would set up days where our United Way representative and folks from Dola would come and sit underneath the, the, the solar panels with a table and provide support to these residents um, 
again, while we were able to offer them some cold drinks, um, some, some ice cream uh, in a situation that they weren't, um, you know, were trying to work their way through. Go ahead and skip to the next slide. Um, this is a, an example, our, our local wildfire mitigation council, um, uh, in trying to get public education out there, we set the trailer up at our local farmer's market. Um, this was really interesting because, you know, again, we, we were able to, to have the refrigerator inside the box fan that you can see, but really we kind of used it as a demonstration piece um, in, a, in a comfortable area for us to sit um, during the farmer's market and hand out public education material. What I thought was interesting, though, is for everyone that's familiar with farmer's markets, um, we started getting a lot of the vendors that were running generators behind their 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 trailers or their food trucks or their tent set up and they were wondering if they could utilize this trailer to help them and not have to run their little mini generators for all of those those food trucks and support trailers and so we we never actually pulled it off for this farmer's market um, but we started working with the director of the farmer's market and we're gonna position this trailer for our public education closer to where they have the food truck set up and start experimenting with how we could utilize it for, to help support some of these um, vendors. And really the, um, the, the director of the farmer's market was starting to consider whether it would be worth purchasing a trailer such as this um, to help support the farmer's market. Um, you can go ahead to the next slide. Uh, this is just another picture of the, the trailer out at the command post. Um, and before, just for me to wrap up, the other thing that I, I did want to talk about real quickly is what the fire department um, is working on now with the trailer is um, rehab. Um, uh, looking at the trailer as rehab support. So this would be um, not only for countywide events, large wildfires, but also as deployment for small events. And so we are looking to set up, again, we have the, the refrigerator in there, we have the box fan, the table in there, some chairs. And so it can be easily deployed with that small um, vehicle that you see in the picture. Um, and so whether it's myself or one of our division chiefs that can tow the trailer out to a structure fire event, um, a wildfire event, a hazardous materials event, um, and provide a place with shade. Um, we could set up emergency monitoring, so we'd have some, some monitors, um, some chairs. We'd be able to provide um, responders with some cool drinks and a place to cool down while we take their vitals um, before they go back in on another rotation. Um, on the flip side of this, um, we also have many events in the wintertime that requires a warm place to to come in and just warm up. And so a small space heater with, um, with some chairs and tables, some warm food, coffee, and that sort of thing can be set up in this trailer. Um, and that's how we're looking to, to utilize it um, uh, throughout the kind of year round um, to support the fire department and local agencies as well. Um, and then uh, the other thing, uh, emergency management wise, and I don't wanna jump on Craig's footsteps, um, but uh, we we've been looking at the trailer to for shelter support, and so uh, our high risks in our area are wildfires, which is a big one. Which um, we set up, we're starting to see ourselves set up shelters more and more. But also um, severe storms, and we've been doing drills for power outages, and what we might do for power outages when we have to. Um, evacuate people from their homes or they might be on oxygen or not be able to, to let, stay in their homes for more than a couple days because they don't have any way to, to, to heat their homes. Um, we can set this up in, in more numerous, more sort of decentralized shelters. So we might have one shelter that has a generator at a school, um, but we, might, we can um, support other shelters um, so not everybody's in one place. Um, and this was uh, something we considered during COVID where we didn't necessarily want to put uh, potentially 200 to 400 people under one shelter all in one big room. Um, it would have been more ideal to, to separate them out. Um, so utilizing that trailer for, for more regional um, and larger scale events. And so uh, that was our experience with the trailer. Um, so I can wrap up my talk and, and go to the next slide.
Thanks, Chuck, as well. Hello, everyone. I'm Craig Moreau. I'm the Chief of Emergency Management and Homeland Security for Fayette County, Texas, which is a uh, fairly rural area between Houston and San Antonio and Austin. Uh, I'm also a senior captain with the Houston Fire Department, so I kind of get to, to wear both hats, both literally and figuratively, uh, when it comes to emergency management and dealing with, with big emergencies. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about my background in, in dealing with generators uh, when it comes to um, uh, having having them for hurricanes and different events. Uh, I, I worked in the medical center in Houston, which is uh, prone to floods and prone to some, some pretty big emergencies. We also have the world's largest rodeo that happens in the, in the medical center uh, at the uh, Energy Stadium in the Astrodome. And almost every year uh, we would go out and uh, we to report someone down and, and we inevitably be over by the horse trailers where they have some sleeping uh, quarters built into these horse trailers and, and someone would be dead from carbon monoxide poisoning. It just happened year after year after year. We could almost predict that, that we would lose uh, a cowboy or two every year uh, during the rodeo. Uh, they would park all the horse trailers with the sleeping quarters side by side, and uh, one generator would feed into the air induct for, for another one, and it, and it led to some uh, disastrous ends. Uh, and even with you know, carbon monoxide detectors, we would, we would enforce and everything else. Uh, people would not uh, do them correctly, and folks, uh, would die. Uh, the other incidents that I had was people who were uh, using generators sometimes for the first time. We're talking small portable generators, gasoline almost exclusively uh, after uh, hurricanes. Um, after Hurricane Ike, we lost uh, power in Houston, which is uh, 3.2 million people uh, for uh, nine days. And so generators were at a, at a premium. People were scrambling to get whatever they could, and they were running their whole house off of them. Of course, it was also very hot because it's Houston, and uh, you would have sometimes 90, 95, 100 degree days with 100% humidity, and people had to keep those generators going. Uh, there was a young man uh, who was trying to take care of his family and went out uh, to refill his generator after it ran out of gas, and a little bit of the gas uh, got on the exhaust. It ignited and burned uh, almost all of the skin on his body off. Uh, he had uh, second and third degree burns for about 85% of his body, which is something that is generally not even survivable. He, he did survive, but had uh, major problems um, associated with it. Uh, in the county, uh, we do use generators, uh, and we use them fairly often for big events and other things. Uh, and, you know, we haven't had the, the deaths and the injuries associated with the large generators uh, like we do with the smaller generators, but they do provide... Uh, a, a massive expense. It's hard to get fuel uh, for them, and they're very, very, very loud. Um, that led me to Footprint Project. Really, just on a random uh, Google search, I found this company that was making these solar-powered generators. And for a couple of different reasons, it was interesting to me. And so I made contact with Will, uh, and uh, we were kind of talking back and forth about what it would look like to get some solar generators to Fayette County uh, when our uh, winter storm Uri occurred. Uh, I don't know how much you guys know about Texas, but single-digit temperatures in te Texas are not a common thing. Uh, we don't get it very often in our area, sometimes way up in the panhandle. Um, but for days and days and days, we were below freezing, and we had burst pipes all over the county. And uh, everyone uh, in, in Texas was suffering from uh, a lack of electricity. Uh, the rolling blackouts happened on a regular basis, uh, and uh, there was just too much of a demand on the system. And coupled with that, uh, after a day of light drizzle, we had electrical poles and electrical lines down uh, throughout the county. Uh, one night, I met with a footprint project uh, in the middle of the night, and they gave me our first uh, solar generator. Uh, this was a, an earlier model. It was a uh, it's 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 a just a rolling cart. You might see normally a band rolling around some of their equipment in a roadie case. Uh, they call it, and it's got a stack of generators. I'm sorry, a stack of batteries inside it and it's got an inverter and four panels uh, that could be deployed. And there you go, you can see it set up uh, at our uh, COVID vaccination clinic. Uh, I was able to use this generator uh, during the freeze to get some, some power to people who didn't have power, who needed it. Uh, and I've used it subsequently for, for a lot of different events, primarily COVID related events. Uh, we were the first rural county to have uh, drive-through testing uh, in, in anywhere in Texas. We're also the first rural county to do a drive-through uh, vaccination clinic. You see that gentleman right there is especially green because he took his bicycle 
uh, to our drive through vaccination clinic. Uh, behind you, the big truck is much more uh, commonly what we saw. Uh, and I had very good results with it. We were able to set it up. There was no noise. There was no issues. Uh, I'm, I'm very impressed that these things can hold a, a charge as long as they can. And even if we need to deploy in the middle of the night, I can run uh, what I need to run for a pretty significant amount of time. Uh, we ha have a newly formed community emergency response team in Fayette County, and that, and that team is now trained in it. And I can just send them out, say, hey, go get it, uh, bring it out here and deploy uh, for a variety of events. Uh, the chief who spoke previous to me said that uh, they're using it for some rehab. Uh, rehab is fire department word for, hey, I'm really tired and I need a, I need a break. And um, the, the rehab units uh, provide water and, and, and getting out of your gear and, and just kind of letting these firefighters and other first responders catch their breath so they can go in and, and do their job uh, some more. So our community emergency response team uh, runs that rehab uh, along with a, uh, another volunteer organization we have called Feed the Need. They have to go out and, and cook hamburgers on site uh, for the for the crews, so I have a, a bite to eat. I can tell you that's very, very, very welcome. And so, uh, my you know my experience with solar generators didn't come the traditional way. We weren't necessarily looking for you know the most green natural solution out there. Uh, maybe I should have been, but in, in rural Texas, that isn't always our first thought, uh, unfortunately. But um, once I was exposed to it, I'll say it really does impress me. Uh, from a, from a green standpoint, it's fantastic. Uh, from a safety standpoint, it's fantastic, and having uh, no noise while you're able to generate electricity is, is a big deal, and it allows us to, to be resilient in times when our electricity is down, it allows us to place electricity in places that normally wouldn't have it, and it allows us to um, just, just be more resilient in, in almost every way. And um, I think that's the last slide on there, but I'll be more than happy to, to answer any questions you have. And uh, just a glowing recommendation to me, both conceptually on, on what can be done and also in the, the product that I have. Uh, it's been very uh, rugged and uh, easy to use for, for a lot of people. Thank you. Well, thanks, Craig. And I, I must say that earlier, um, that's what we call a, a really peer community build that was assembled by our volunteers pretty much the day after the, the winter storms occurred in that roadie case that people saw there. And um, it's for us, it's just really exciting to see what happens when we can um, get this equipment into first responders' hands like yourselves. Like we never know how you're gonna use it, if you're gonna use it, et cetera. Some of these stories are great like yours. Some of them are much more challenging where people use it for a big heater during a you know a winter event and it dies within you know an hour because we didn't, you know, give them the education or the training on how to triage your and their energy loads so um jamie managed to to sneak in here while while we were off video um hey everyone i'm jamie sweezy i'm the program manager at footprint project um sorry i was late we were just finishing up some meetings um on the hill in dc including i think i don't know craig if uh will mentioned that we met with congressman mccall's office and sung your sung your praises Excellent, excellent. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, Congressman McCall's got his hands in a lot of things, including uh, Homeland Security, and um, he's, he would be a good advocate to, to get some of this stuff deployed. You know, conceptually, you can go about it some different ways. You can say, oh, you know, it's, the, it's this carbon footprint and all those things, and which is true and it's great. Um, but I think one important theme to, to push forward is how much this increases our resilience and really does make our homeland more secure when we have a variety of sources. Uh, we've seen several times uh, when getting fuel was was an absolute no-go. Um, we had a, an evacuation out of Houston a few years ago. It was a it was a hurricane that was supposed to strike and cause a lot of damage. The hurricane wound up moving, but the evacuation of three million people uh, led to countless deaths. Uh, people burned to death because they ran out of gas, pulled over, parked in the high weeds, and then their bus caught on fire and, and all these different problems. And uh, having having alternative fuel sources, be that sun, be that natural gas, be that uh, biodiesel, whatever it is, um, makes us more resilient and makes us more secure. Well, thank you, everyone. This has been a really informative webinar. Um, we have quite a few questions, but I do suggest if anyone out there has more questions, we have a little bit extra time today for more. So I'm going to get things 
um, kicked off with a question for you, Will. Have you ever utilized in your trailers um, recycled equipment, like for batteries or inverters? And if so, how do you test them for safety beforehand? And, and in general, who provides the maintenance on your systems? Yeah, it's a great question. So I think it comes down to breaking down the difference between recycled and repurposed. So we we did trial fully recycle, you know, a company that was making up taking Nissan Leaf battery packs, breaking them down, testing all the individual lithium AA cells, then repackaging them. Um, we tried that once and then we decided to for future units, including the one that, that Chuck has, the trailer trailer and steamboat springs, that one has an a repurposed a rely on battery, actually two of them. So they're basically were bought from a company. They were going to integrate them into a trailer. They never did, but they were a single pack that never got broken out, re fully recycled. So I think for what we're doing mostly is we'd call it second life equipment. So it's either manufacturer test batteries that are um, have been tested to a specific spec, and then that manufacturer is like, we can't sell this here to you know enjoy and we were like yay right um the for the the challenge with the recycling is there's one it's a variance on how many cycles you're going to get out of that battery so it's usually a lower cycle life um and unfortunately there's just not enough uh like the cost ratio like getting a recycled lithium battery is just not co cost effective enough when you're looking at the full integration cost of building a mobile solar generator to justify that um, decreased cycle life and you know potentially added risk so there's you know every all these batteries have a bms a, a battery management system the, that's what keeps them within their, their specific voltage ranges and we do you know we're working on developing a better fleet maintenance you know plan because to be honest you know for Chuck, that system has been out there with Steamboat Springs for I don't know almost a year now, and we're gonna we're gonna get eyes on it again for the first time in a month. So there are people regionally that we're looking at contracting in you know in Colorado, in Texas, et cetera, to provide that maintenance. So we're not the ones you know sending a volunteer on a flight to go troubleshoot a single system in a single state. So it's definitely a, a piece of the puzzle that we're, we're working on. What's great about the the um, lithium ferrous phosphate battery technology is that it is super safe. It's not that nickel manganese cobalt chemistry that has a higher risk of thermal runaway, and it's um, it's you know really durable in the sense that you can beat the heck out of them and they'll pop back up. Um, which really makes you know we have a number of trailers that are flooded lead acid batteries. And those things, you know, if we don't have someone testing the gravity levels and adding distilled water and all this stuff, there, you know, we we have a couple of them out in California that are just no longer functional. We have to replace the whole the whole battery stack. So that's a long-winded way of saying, you know, we're getting there. One what and one more thing I'll add to that is we do, aside from batteries, we do use kind of a, I don't know if it would be, you know, recycled or repurposed, but um, we get a lot of donated equipment from uh, Schneider Electric. Um, so they have donated inverters that are, you know, perfectly good in box, but they're kind of, they're last year's model. And so what would otherwise be just sitting in a warehouse bound for either a landfill or bound for that warehouse for the rest of their lives, those we need to um, go into our mobile solar generators. Yeah. That's solar really helpful. And solar panels, yeah. Great. Uh, yeah, that we had a, quite a few questions about that, so thank you. That helps a lot. I wanted to ask a question to Chief Sarasoli. Um, you had mentioned, talked quite a bit about your trailer, and a lot of the questions that came up were the price and how much power was really, how how long did the battery last for, and how much power were you able to use? Um, price would have to go to Will and Jamie. <laughs> um, I don't know the answer to that one. Uh, we, so our understanding is the trailer actually will collect eight kilowatts an hour um, through the solar panels that are on it. And we have about 30, 30 kilowatt for um, storage. 
So there's quite a bit of power on the trailer. And to be honest with you, we never even um, came close to bumping up against that. Um, the, the trailer is always in the sun. Um, you know, the great thing about living in Colorado is we always have sun. So it's always in the sun and staying um, topped off basically. And, um, and the uses we had, to be honest with you, just didn't draw a lot of power. And so we, we never even touched the potential of, of the trailer draw, being drawn down. That's one, I know this is live, but it's awesome to hear. I kind of, every once in a while when we activate this equipment with, with partner first responders, we're like, when are they gonna kill the battery? Like how much, eventually they'll plug in enough to drain it. Um, so that's like huge win for us. So often this is not always the case. We've done many responses where people plug in way too much and they drain the battery and it, you know, goes dark. Um, so for the cost thing, that unit that was in those photos, our um, cost with uh, the all the way through, including deployment to you, Chuck, was about a seventy thousand dollar, you know, ticket price. That included, you know, what you'll notice on that trailer is that it had um, traditional solar panels, so they're glass frame modules, and we had to design or contract an engineer to design an aluminum racking system to go over a standard trailer frame. So we get that a lot where it's like you either use lighter, flexible, more expensive modules that can you can peel and stick on, pan, on the trailer frame, or you design this racking system that can support that 50 pound per panel weight and that's i mean it's it's i'm glad you're the sd can tow it because it's it's probably you know a four thousand pound unit maybe three three thirty five hundred based on how much stuff you put in on top of it um that battery bank is to rely on 300 amp hour batteries so you're you know thir thir about 30 kilowatt hours of storage. um so it's it is a it's a good you know it's a workhorse of a system as long as people like the folks plugging in and you guys got really good at it <laughs> learned on the job like a lot of uh first responders tend to do um understanding that all right a, a small heater is runs at 1500 watts so you could run that thing for what is that 20 ish hours right but then if that if the sun is cloudy or something you're gonna you know you're trying to leave that out there for a long time it might you might have an issue so I think what we're getting better at is extent, basically building as much storage into these units as, as we can possibly find or budget for. And that then makes the end user's job a lot easier because you don't touch, you know, most of the time, you're not touching that, that size. You know, you're not getting down to the bottom 10%. Yeah, and you know, I'll just add that the battery management system is pretty straightforward and, and informative. Um, to you or to look at and know where you are. And one of the things we're working on now is, is figuring out our connectivity to it through the app so that we can actually, it, when we leave it out at the trailer park like we did, we could monitor where we are and if it's being overused or not. Um, and then the rack system, at least in this case, we really like it because it provides shade. It provides a great place to sit underneath and, and be in the shaded area. Yeah, I like that unit. That's T5. It's one of my favorites. Nice one. It's a nice rig. Sorry, Craig. You get you got the <laughs> I'm in Texas. I need the shade, guys. Come on. <laughs> We're working on it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I really want to build a command trailer that's got uh, the flip-out panels uh, able to do that. And whether that's a commercially available product or when we build in-house, uh, that's on my five-year goal and something that we we've identified as a need. Uh, you know, and uh, being able to go out and remotely set up for days on end uh, without any electricity around is, is a big deal for us. Great, thank you. Uh, another question, I'm trying to go through the questions as uh, as we seem to have demand. There are a lot of questions. I'm trying to get as many as possible, but I'm starting with the ones that have been reiterated the most. And one of those are, have any, uh, whether it's Footprint Project or any of our emergency management partners, has anyone calculated the cost savings that are associated with using solar and storage over diesel, including things like permitting the cost of diesel itself, the cost of acquiring uh, fuel when there is a, a shortage, an emergency, or has that been a part of anyone's kind of considerations thus far? 
Oh man, that's a fantastic yeah. question. I mean, the short answer is for us, like kind of, but mostly no, because it's a goal. It's a that yeah, holistic reporting on it's so person or case dependent. So it's really hard to say, all right, since this trailer was deployed, we that fuel supply chain savings has been X for this specific site. It just gets very and I, Chuck and Craig, you guys might have better answers on this, but for us, it gets really complicated to say, like, we saved that site X number of dollars this day. Well, because often some of, we're not always um, in a disaster situation, we're not always displacing a gas generator. And sometimes we're providing power where they wouldn't have had power at all. So. Yeah, I, I don't I don't think in, in at least our context, um, <clears throat> direct cost savings for fuel is something that, that comes even into the calculus for this it's you know does it make us more resilient does it make us more more capable of course to save some diesel fuel uh here and there but um you know in the middle of a, a crisis the, the cost of diesel fuel is um minimal uh, in, in comparison to you know someone that doesn't have a refrigerator store their insulin or you know to power their oxygen machine or those are those are the types of things that that where the cost savings really comes in it's it's the cost savings of an ambulance ride it's the cost savings of you know, a, a potential death. I mean, those are the those are the cost savings that that I see much more than uh, than diesel fuel. Yeah, I would agree. We haven't done we haven't done that analysis. Although those are the type analysis I like to do. Um, but you know, in a lot of our examples, like the 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 trailer park example, I mean, setting up a generator wasn't wasn't even in the the consideration of doing that. So the trailer really provided us an option and and a benefit that. Um, was it either there or not? We weren't going to set up a generator and, and well, I say that it, it didn't really um, occur to us to, to set up a generator and have it running with its fumes and noise 24/7. And so, um, so it, it, it's not a you know this replaced this scenario. Yeah, it is. I and think that, it is. Sorry, I was just going to say, and that would be the case same with like the rehabilitation use. Um, again, we're, we typically aren't considering setting up a trailer and putting a generator in it and doing the same thing with it. This is a benefit that um, that is provided because of the, the situation. That being said, though, I could see, um, you know, like the shelter management and shelter support um, really could be a, an offset that we could calculate costs for and, and probably will at some point. It's exciting to think about. I think the challenge is getting to the apples to apples comparison. And a lot of times, like we, you know, both you and Craig were saying, like these things provide a different tactical advantage and it's a different tool in the toolkit for emergency managers. So it's really hard to say, all right, because I used this new tool, I'm not using my old tool. Like I'm still going to use my old tool, right? But they're just different. So yeah, I'm, I'm looking, I hope we can kind of do better holistic reporting in the future using case studies from, from Chuck and Craig and other um, partners, um, you know, boots on the ground. Um, but I think that that shelter, you know, large scale wildfires, there's a really cool initiative coming out of the US Forest Service right now calling it called the Greening Fire Teams Initiative. And they're starting to do that math, which is really exciting. Um, I think it's that more into the large scale like 20 to 200 kilowatt generator displacements where you're starting to see all right we're building we're bringing in a hybridized like hydrogen battery solar microgrid and then we're not running fuel at all right like there's no diesel supply chain but person like for footprint that's really outside of our current funding scope yeah, if I say that right, we don't have the 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 cash to drop big dollars on fancy hydrogen fuel cells to toys yet. I, I mean, I you know when I mentioned it, like these these type two and type one incident management teams that are managing you know these large scale fires, it, I could easily see a vision of of eliminating the generators that they bring in um, and setting up some of the arrays that you, you know, you had on your, your presentation. Um, that seems like a no brainer to me. Yeah. Just getting through that 
like the logistics, the training, getting the equipment available in this place is like, there's just not enough of this stuff out there, much less, you know, once it's out there, then the question is who's setting it up, who's maintaining, etc. Um, so we're kind of scratching the surface of a lot of this, this, this little game. Sorry, Mario, we could talk about this for- No, it's good. This is, this is all good. Um, just to, to keep moving, another question is related to like, we talk a lot about these generators being out in the field. Uh, Chuck or Craig, have either of you used your trailers to basically be connected to a regular facility and like turn that facility into a resilience hub? Or is it typically you use them out in, in the field? Uh, well, we used ours, um for a vaccine clinic that was kind of close to another area, but we're able to, to kind of separate it and, and give uh, electricity to a place on a standalone facility that didn't have electricity uh, before. And that, that was beneficial. Let us put, kind of put it out in the front instead of being uh, in, in Fayette County, we have these massive antique fairs twice a year. And you can kind of get lost in the shuffle uh, with all these vendors all over the place and having it being able to be at a you know brick and mortar location, but Kind of set apart and and uh, was 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 an advantage for for a visibility standpoint. Um, from a resilience standpoint, I haven't had that uh, quite yet, where it was a backup in case the other uh, electricity failed. But that's definitely something I would I would consider. Uh, we actually um, we haven't been able to put it to use yet, but this trailer came about at the same time we were adding a um, a natural gas uh, power generator for our one of our fire stations. And we actually had them put in a switch so that we could plug the trailer into the building um, and potentially, you know, you have to downsize what you're using in the building in the emergency so that you don't run the battery down. But um, we, we hope to at least experiment with plugging the trailer in uh, running those those emergency uh, uses in the fire station during a time of a power outage. We actually had a fire station that didn't have any sort of um, generator or power backup, and so um, we were working at these two projects at the same time. But but that's an idea that we really like because um, you could then still utilize the trailer many times throughout the the year, um, and then bring it back to the facility and plug it in. Um, when that need arises and you're not just having um, storage there just sitting for the for the um, you know for the lifetime of the building which never may never have a power outage so I like the idea of the mobile storage for that and we'll probably consider that um, in our new fire station that we're building when we look at store the uh, energy storage awesome I mean just briefly we did it once at a California shelter in Cloverdale that had a manual transfer switch. We're not, you know, the electrician that shows up to do that. They had their grounds facility manager. You know, we dropped the trailer off. They had the transfer switch. We they wire, you know, plugged it in and pulled the pulled the lever, then plugged it in so that they're not back feeding to the grid. Um, but it is, I think, a really exciting, you know, vision of where this stuff could go, particularly if um, critical infrastructure like fire stations are already outfitted with their own microgrids, then the, having these dis physically dispatchable systems that could talk to the permanent um, system and supplement it or draw from it is, is kind of our dream scenario for how this, this equipment could be better utilized. It would not replacing or displacing or, or adding a tactical value on an off-grid deployment um it's just that there's a lot of pieces in that puzzle to to get through the the electrical wiring the utility and and making sure that all those those t's are checked we're working on a pilot in new orleans right now and we're with technical assistance fund support from clean energy group and we're very excited to like share that report when we're when we're um, done with it great yeah that's an exciting project we will have a separate uh webinar as that one as well and keep everyone in the loop. Uh, one of the other questions we got was for you, Will and Jamie, do, did Footprint put together the monitoring and remote monitoring capabilities for their systems? If not, you know, where did you source that from? How are these systems actually controlled? Really quick one, There's not, it's not that exciting. Um, we use Samsara as the one provider for the first trailer. It actually has the, the remote monitoring 
gizmo on the one that Chuck has. We're now um, piloting a, uh, um, our, you know, six units with a company called New Sun Road. They're over the Bay Area and they're providing a remote monitoring stack that that can range from larger trailer um, systems down to portable systems. Like, you know, we don't want to spend two thousand dollars on a really fancy remote monitor for a generator that costs three thousand dollars to build um, or buy. So we're we're trying to kind of put all that stuff in the same portal. And New Sun Road has is, is, uh, been an exciting partner in developing that remote monitoring um, platform along with the hardware um, sensors that work for different um, systems. Ours is really tricky because it's all, you know, so we have 24 volt batteries, we have 38 volt batteries, we have them on portable systems like Craig's, we have them on towable systems like Chuck's. It's a total hodgepodge. So that's been the, the kind of slow or the, the the bridge that we're trying to cross on getting all of those, um, you know, letting all those flowers bloom, but also keeping track on where the, the heck they are and are they on, right? That's the, that's the kind of long push. Right. And a follow up to that for Craig and Chuck, is there as kind of like the, the leaders in trying to understand this demonstra really demonstration project and how it can be replicable, replicable for other folks nationally. Is there anything that you would, having had had access to this, is there anything that you'd like to see that would be helpful moving forward for uh, trailer capabilities? Is there anything that you wish you had or something that you would alter? What kind of has been your feedback in terms of that? Well, I, I don't mind going first on that. Um, I'd like to have a bigger unit, uh, a command unit that, that I could uh, deploy easily. Uh, but on the smaller side, you know, mine was a volunteer built unit. And I think that's a, a really cool project for uh, high schoolers and, and technology classes and different things they can do. And, you know, I, whereas, you know, a bunch of adults probably aren't going to have the time to do like Will was talking about taking apart a Nissan, Nissan Leaf battery. Uh, that's perfect for high school students, you know, test it out, see if it's right, put it together, you know, deploy these things. Uh, make some of the small little backpack generators I can deploy out to the folks in my county who are relying on electricity for their oxygen and for their other medical needs. I mean, I, I would I would love to see this uh, be a community project. Uh, there's there's some some beauty in, in what comes with this. That there's a big commercial turnkey if you got the money for it. But if you don't, there's also an alternative to make things better uh, on a community level, and I think that's fantastic. Um, you know, uh, I, I don't know that we've come up with any like, oh, if we could only do this or that. There's a, a few little things that we've come across, like adapters that we could use or, you know, uh, to for different plugs and, and, and that sort of thing. But um, but really, the size of this trailer is 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 great for our application. And, and I, I I was saying earlier before we had it. I think it was hard to envision how we'd use it, all the places we would use it. You know, you could come up with a, with a few that were obvious. But once we got it here, um, the ideas really started just rolling off the top of our head. And so I think as we continue to use it more, um, those things will pop up and then we'll have different ideas. I do like what Craig said. I like the idea of suppose, what you could have, like for that severe storm event where you have a power outage with um, with you know, sub-zero temperatures where people might be able to heat their homes with wood fire. Um, but if we had some portable systems we could deploy out of it to homes, it's a lot, it's a lot easier to help. Uh, I don't want to say it's less expensive, but um, some folks really are better off staying in their home. They're set up there. They want to be there. They, they, you know, they have a family, um, maybe folks that, uh, you know, can't get around as much, they're wheelchair bound or, or um, some other issues that maybe really makes it difficult for them to go to a shelter and, and stay there. Um, if we could pr provide those portable units to a home, um, that would be a, a tremendous asset. You could do it out of, out of, you know, a unit like mine. Like I said, there's a lot of space in the back of this unit, you could have um, portable units charged up and ready to go. That's something that, we, oh, sorry. I was just gonna say, just to echo that, as Clean Energy Group dives more into how solar and storage can support medically vulnerable communities, that's something that comes up time and time again. If you have electricity dependent medical equipment, if you have mobility limitations, if you're a senior and you're not comfortable leaving your immediate community, how can we make sure these folks are 
um, being served because they're typically the first person who might not be experiencing an emergency during a power outage right away, but then waits for an emergency to happen before they call 911 or they go to the hospital. And if we could provide support through resilience somewhere between those, it, it might help reduce the burden on uh, healthcare infrastructure, improve um, the quality of life for folks that are either homebound or have a difficult time leaving home. So I just wanted to highlight it because I think that's, a, that's an especially important point as we think forward towards resilient systems, mobility, things like that. You, you know, in our area, uh, uh, ranchers have uh, tremendous livestock that they need to keep taking care of, right? And so for them to leave their property for four or five days or more um, is not an option for them. They're going to stay home. And um, yeah, so how we can support them is huge. Um, yeah, and one of the things that we um, kind of piloted in uh, New Orleans last month with the uh, tornado that hit there, um, we piloted a battery library. So one of our solar trailers has a lockers on the side of it, um, each with, you know, a, a regular outlet and a USB plug in it. And so we use that trailer as kind of a base um, with another group, community group called Together New Orleans. and uh had small just portable you know cell phone cell phone size batteries that people could check out you know check out with a on, on a clipboard and then bring it back home with them and you know have it for the night and then bring it back in the morning grab a new one that's fully charged um and then we also worked with them a little bit thank god we didn't need we didn't need to do this but they um one of the things we we, we tend to do during a, a disaster is work with local communities who know kind of the area and the vulnerable populations within their community so that, you know, is there someone that, you know, is homebound and needs their own, you know, personal battery that we can provide to them. We usually don't have, you know, a huge stock of those. Normally it's, you know, the trailers and it's these community hubs that we provide resilient power for. But in the event that there is someone, you know, that they can pinpoint, um, we try to, we try to find those folks as well. Yeah, I think that that's where it's really exciting to see these, you know, as this equipment gets into the hands of, of first responders like, you know, Chuck and Craig, like yourselves, as you're playing, playing is the wrong word, but um, using equipment and, you know, rethink, you can focus on the perfect solar trailer, right? Like you could design that or you can, you know, set up the humans that know we're gonna move this battery to this person's home. And instead of this automated battery, you know, it could be a really fancy, you know, actuator, solar robot thing, or, or it can just be a person with a clipboard. And oftentimes the person with the clipboard combined with the portable and the mobile batteries, it's like, that's resilience. Well, and, and you know, when we were, t when we were just talking about this, so, uh, if you had a, a portable battery system uh, like Craig has, and it, what we could be doing is we could deploy it to a home, have reserves charging, right? Then the next day or two days later, come back, um, switch them out, and just start charging ours on the solar trailer. Again, we don't, you know, we're anticipating a whole community power outage. Um, that would be a great system to have, right? Just drive around and recharging them through the solar trailer. And, and switching them out from home to home. Now, you know, numbers will limit you. Obviously, if you're, if you're a community of thousands that, that have no power, it'll be difficult to get everybody power. But, you know, as Mariel said, the, the communities of the folks that can't leave their home um, would limit those numbers. Yeah, you target the people who, who would need it the most. You know, most, if you, if you shut down a community of eight or 10,000 people, probably, 9,500 of those are going to be just fine. Another 400 are going to need a little bit of help. And it's, you're really down to maybe 100 folks, uh, which is 25 houses that, that need some significant help from uh, from the community. And so uh, it, it's, it really doesn't become that big of a number, even if you've got a, a rather large population. Now, Houston, we've got a little different scenario, but um, you know, that's, not, that's not what we're dealing with here. Great. And, you know, one question regarding federal funding, and I know we haven't dived a lot into costs yet, but a lot of folks are saying this is so this is so great. This is emergency response. This is emergency preparedness in a new and meaningful way. But how have I not heard about funding opportunities through 
um, like federal disaster relief or FEMA or um, any sort of kind of like emergency related disaster related funding stream. Has anyone had success with looking for funding towards the, these areas? Is, is this like an area of improvement? Uh, what can, you know, can people look towards these entities for support? What's been your experience? Uh, we, well, we, have, uh, <laughs> we have not, we have not, this is, you know, the trail we've been fortunate enough. However, that has been a thought process for us. And, um, you know, there's some large FEMA grants out there that I think you could easily make the argument for um, uh, that would fit in. There's some specifically for the fire service. There's a lot for emergency services, um, but we haven't dove into um, specifics yet on which ones would be applicable. I put in for a grant uh, for that uh, command trailer I keep talking about, and it ranked high, but did not meet the uh, funding uh, because some of the funds to Homeland Security on the regional level uh, were cut. So uh, had it had it been put in just a couple of years before when there was more funding, it would have been uh, fully paid for um, by um, by regional Homeland Security grants. Uh, I'm, I'm looking for other opportunities as well. Of course, we have a lot of different projects we want to get funded, and some meet better than others, but um, that's that's something that is very interesting to me. Also, the the trailer uh, that we'll demonstrate earlier that's got that kind of swarm, uh, I think you called it, uh, in there that, that uh, I think uh, fits a whole lot of different check boxes for different uh, projects and people should strongly consider looking at those. I mean, I wish we could, I, I mean, we're, we're trying to scale this as quickly as we can and we want to support, you know, uh, emergency managers across the country are, are dealing with these same problems and they're not going away. I think the, we've gotten lucky with funding really most of our money and, and support is coming from energy companies that want to see their, you know, participate in the work we're doing and see their, you know, their logo on solar panels and solar trailer things going around supporting um, communities in need. I think the the challenge with with federal and, and state funding, and particularly through FEMA, is most people don't understand that FEMA is a reimbursement agency, and a lot of that, you know, grant funding comes at the request of local counties after a storm. So when you're looking at how to how are we going to finance a thousand trailers in Colorado or a thousand trailers outside of Houston, right? That's really more of a workforce development program or a tax incentive and a, and a you know rental or lease you know startup thing that could be incubated out of a resilience wow. grant but like there those getting this stuff to scale is going to take a lot of partners it's going to take these conversations happening um, more frequently and bringing in new sources of, of funding that that we, we to date have not been able to secure so we're, we're looking at how to use EDFIs, community development and, and foundation investments, how to use private investment, how to, you know, compare that with grants, activate the equipment. I mean, it's an all of all of the above approach because, you know, we operate a network of about 50 of these pieces of equipment. That's a drop in the bucket for, you know, gas and generator use. Just, it's just not, it's barely touches, you know, it's a, it's a great, Great case study, but to scale this is going to require a lot more people. We did we did just hear over the past couple of days in our meetings on the Hill that there's um, the bipartisan infrastructure bill in its current form at least has um, a quite a bit of money in it for um, resilient infrastructure and the language is pretty broad. So it's, you know, would be for grants to states for developing resilient infrastructure, which I think this would definitely fall under. Hopefully, knock on wood. Yeah, who, who knows there, right? Um, so I do want to say we're, you know, we're coming towards a close here, and uh, I would be remiss not to mention the amount of questions we're getting about how do we talk to Footprint Project about um, if we're interested in a trailer. Is there a specific area of the country that you work in? Uh, kind of where's your, what's your geographic boundaries? How do people get involved, and what should they do if they're interested? We're, we're <laughs> hi. No, it's um, our we're focusing our efforts on the Gulf Coast and the Pacific Coast. Like we know, I mean, the Rocky Mountains, lucky. Um, but uh, Tennessee, know, Kentucky. Tennessee, Kentucky. That's a broad kind of Tornado characteristic. Valley, kind of. But 
Yeah, we're really trying, you know, we're from Minnesota, both of us, it's not, we don't have any equipment left in Minnesota. It's all been pushed south or, or west. Um, we want to be clear that we're not the manufacturers. So if you want, if, you, if, if there's people on this call that want to buy or, you know, own a trailer, right? They're Google solar trailers. You'll find people that make them go make that happen. Like that's the best. Yes, go forth. We're happy to help provide, in, you know, pro bono advice or consulting or whatever on how to get your mobile solar, you know, or mobile microgrid project. It's not just solar, but other um, sources of renewable or cleaner energy off the ground um, for the like in those really climate or environmental emergency vulnerable regions, we do have some equipment in, in Louisiana that we're trying to activate more frequently. We're trying, we have a number of trailers we're trying to upgrade across California. So if there, if you're in those regions, we'd love to talk. Oftentimes we can provide donated equipment into a grant as a cost share that will allow a project hopefully to get across the finish line. We have a number of, you know, inverters or solar panels, pieces of equipment that we haven't been able to find funding to cobble together yet. So that's always you know, part of the I think, conversation that we'd love to have. Um, and yeah, I mean, we're trying, please just reach out in our, you know, our emails are, general email is info at footprintproject.org. It's also on our website. Um, we'll be as responsive as we can, but we're also activated for, you know, multiple events and, and um, you know, we're, we're grinding. So we'll, please try and, uh, and please let us know you're around and we'll, we'll particularly if there's a already a, a grant or something that you have available and you're like, I just need to know what to ask for. That's, we can do that. That's easy, right? The question is when it's like, we want to do this, but, we need the funding, we need the technical support, we need the logistics, we need all of it. Like we're just you're looking at time staff footprint project. So just be be patient with us as we try to get this um scaled. But we need more we need more Chucks and Craigs in this world. So if you're a Chuck or a Craig, reach out please. <laughs> And also, uh, you know, I want to mention we've gotten a lot of questions regarding stationary solar and storage units. Um, this focus of this webinar was really on the creation of mobile solar and storage and how that supported emergency management efforts. We have plenty of case studies and webinars on our website that review um, stationary applications at like community centers, affordable housing, um, county facilities, things like that. I also encourage anyone who's interested in developing a project, whether it's mobile solar and storage or um, a stationary unit, Clean Energy Group is here to offer one-on-one -on -one technical support and talk you through that. We also have some um, lim limited funding programs, such as our technical assistance fund, which can actually support the development of a solar and storage feasibility assessment, which will give you, and I will mention it here, as supporting some of the uh, mobile storage and storage, mobile solar and storage units, that really gives you a first step in the door to understand cost, where it could be cited, um, you know, what are potential incentives available, what are the technicalities, and, and that report has really um, provided a lot of organizations with support, and it is focused on serving low income or otherwise underserved communities. So I would like to thank all of our uh, presenters today. We have had 45 minutes of Q&A, which I think is the longest we have ever had. So. Thank you for answering so many great questions. If any questions were missed and you're just really uh, itching to, to get an answer, please feel free to email me and I'll make sure to get those to one of our presenters for a response. Um, you can also reach out with any questions regarding resilience in general and I'll be happy to provide the support that I can. But thank you, Will, Chuck and Craig. This has been hugely informative and the recording of the webinar will be available in a couple of days if you'd like to, to rewatch or um, share with your networks. The last thank you. thing I'll say, yeah, thank you. The last thing I'll say is we have a couple upcoming webinars for anyone who wants to attend. Uh, Building Community Resilience with Green Mountain Power, which is the primary utility in Vermont, will be uh, Wednesday, May 18th. And then we have a couple other one, great ones coming later this month as well into June. So I suggest you register for those and check them out. But um, again, thank you to all, everyone for attending and thank you for our great panelists. This was truly a, an insightful and really helpful conversation. Thanks, Mari. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Craig.